Physics and math are two subjects we are exposed to before we even enter college, and if you like both, then logically you may want to major in one, but can't decide which one to pick. Well, let's go through some of the similarities and differences so you can make a more educated decision. First, I want to say that all physics majors take a lot of the same classes in undergrad, but depending on which concentration you want to go into, you will branch off and take different electives towards the end of college than other physics majors who choose a different route. The same thing applies to math majors, but you really only pick between applied math and pure math, so there will be differences that I will bring up throughout this video. Physics majors and pure math students have actually very little in common in terms of undergrad, while applied math students and physics students have a few more similarities. Pure math students really don't care about physics, they're more about solving problems in math, which are very high level concepts that physics majors really don't see that I will get into later. And there's also math teaching, but I won't cover that in this video. So let's first start with the curriculum. All physics and math majors take the same three calculus classes that I explained in another video, as well as linear algebra and differential equations that also all engineering majors have to take. Then physics majors and applied math majors will both take another class on vector analysis, which is essentially the math behind what happens when you move an object through some random changing force or vector field for those who have learned what they are. Applied mathematicians and many physicists will also take partial differential equations where you learn how to actually solve these problems for a certain variable. Partial differential equations are essentially equations that represent often three-dimensional systems like heat flow or an electromagnetic wave moving through air. And that's about the extent of their similarities when it comes to undergrad. Applied math students may get a minor in physics where they take physics courses, or physics students may take some electives or get a minor in math but otherwise these cover the similarities that you would see. And these were also more geared towards applied math students. Note that math majors really don't see any physics. At some schools you'll cover the basics, but that's it. But also realize physics majors don't take the high level math courses that I have not discussed yet. Now be aware I'm just referring to required classes in undergrad. This doesn't account for elective classes or physics concepts taught in math classes. For example, math majors, and of course physics majors, learn how to represent the motion of a mass on a spring. You'll see this problem in both a physics class, definitely in vibrations and waves, which math majors don't take, and a math class, likely the first differential equations one, which physics majors do take. But let's see the differences. In the physics class, you'd be asked things like, how long does one cycle take, what happens if you double the mass, when are velocity and acceleration at a maximum, and so on. You'd be given equations, maybe for the time of one cycle, and have to realize if I doubled the mass, the period increases by a factor of the square root of two. You get equations, but have to understand the physics of what is going on. In the math class, it would be, here's the equation that represents the system, and here are the constants and initial position and velocity. Now solve it for position over time. It's just solving the equations that represent the system but you really don't know much behind the physics, like what its energy is or where the equation even came from. You probably won't even have to deal with the units. You just know the math. So this kind of shows some of the differences between an applied math concept and actually applying it in the physics class. And this is similar to like comparing a vector analysis class to an electromagnetic waves class. As a physics major, also be prepared for labs, whereas in math, you won't really see much, if any. As a physics major, you'll learn about equipment that reads electric signals. You'll learn what a spectrometer is and how we can use it to study the spectrum of light coming in from a source. And this is one reason we know what stars are made of from so far away. We analyze their spectrum and different gases release certain frequencies. The spectrometer tells us what those are. There's more labs than this, but that exposure will be valuable when it comes to applying to jobs, especially ones at engineering companies. Now, like I said, the physics classes are not really taken by math majors unless they maybe get a minor. So quantum mechanics, thermal physics, electromagnetic waves, classical mechanics, and all those are unique to physics majors. But now let's talk about what math majors see that physics majors don't. The previous topics in this video really weren't pure math related at all. The next few minutes will include pure math topics and are things you should look into if you are considering pure math. So the first one is a proofs class, which actually I've heard some physics students take at some schools, but this isn't always true. 
So in my math video, I gave an example of if x is odd, prove that x squared is also odd. Where you had to define an odd number as 2n plus 1, where n can be any integer. Then you just plug in 2n plus 1 for x, square it, then move that equation around, where you see that the last part must definitely be odd. So that's one simple example, and you'd see more methods of proving things. For example, if you wanted to prove the square root of 2 is irrational, which means it's an infinitely long, non-repeating decimal, this is actually kind of hard to do. So instead, you prove that the square root of 2 is not rational. This is called proof by contradiction, where you kind of prove the opposite is not true. And you can find lots of videos that show this proof, so I won't really go over it. But basically, you assume that the square root of 2 is rational, so it can be written as a fraction of two integers. Then you square both sides, move some things around, and you see how this is actually not possible. It contradicts the assumption that you made. And you'll keep learning more proof techniques that you use in later classes. Then the next class is Abstract Algebra. All math majors take this, but it's much more applicable for the pure math students. This is where you learn about groups, which I will also explain. Let's take the set of all integers, as in every integer out there from negative infinity to infinity, and we are going to use addition as our operation, and you'll see what I mean. But if you can add integers together, then you will be able to follow along with this. So I'm going to ask four questions. First, would you say that if I added any two integers, any two in the set that I wanted, that I would get another integer? As in, if I add any two numbers in the set, will I get another number that's also in the set? Well, yes, this is true in this case. Add two integers and you get another. This means the set is closed under addition. Okay, second, is there some integer in our set where no matter what other integer I add to it, I get the same one out? And yes, again, this is true, that integer is zero. This is called the identity element, which for this specific set is zero. It adds to anything in our set and you get the same thing out. Next, if I have some integer, again, whatever I want, is there always some other integer that I can add where I get the identity element from above or zero? Again, this is true. There's always just the negative of whatever you have that you add to get zero and everything you see is an integer and therefore it's in our set. This means there's an inverse in our set for every value. And the last one is the simplest in this case, is the operation associative. As in, if you add three numbers together, does how you group them matter? And obviously it doesn't, and this means the operation is associative. The grouping does not matter for any three numbers we pick. So we have closure under addition, all integers added get another integer. We have an identity of zero, because zero plus anything is that same number. We have inverses for all values where any value plus its inverse gives us the identity from above. And the operation is associative. If these four things are true, then this set is a group. And this is the basics of abstract algebra and group theory. So now you can answer, are the integers a group under multiplication? Do they obey everything you see on the left? They are closed. All integers multiplied get another. There is an identity, which is one, because one times any integer gives you that same value. But there's no inverse. If you take five, you can't multiply it by any integer to get one, our identity element. You'd need to multiply by one fifth which is not an integer and not in our set. So the integers are not a group under multiplication. So hopefully you can see why physics majors don't see this. It's a very math heavy topic. It does have applications even in physics and other disciplines. It can be used in chemistry to look at the symmetry of compounds, and it can be seen in elementary particle physics. But those last two are going well beyond the scope of undergrad. As a math student, these will be applied simply to math concepts, like proving there is no, quote, quadratic formula for a fifth degree polynomial. As in, there is no algebraic solution using radicals like the quadratic formula for a polynomial of degree 5 or higher, which is something you'd prove in abstract algebra. See how it applies to math itself, but not directly to physics? That's what pure math is more about. If you want to take this class as a physics student, you need to branch out of your required courses. 
And note, what I just showed you is like day one or two of this class. Just being asked if this set of numbers is a group is as easy as it gets for abstract algebra. The rest is very proofs based, which is why you take that proofs class. So you can apply those concepts to more advanced material. And I just showed you what a group is, but there's also rings, fields, and much more. So you can see why it's very hard to go into detail on these classes. Now another big class for math majors is real analysis, and I won't be doing any more examples by the way. Real analysis is where you basically go back to beginning calculus and prove everything on a much deeper level. Again, this is another proofs class that all math majors take, but is kind of more applicable for pure math students. You'll do limits in a more rigorous way. You'll prove that a function is continuous or not rather than just looking at it and seeing that it is or isn't. You'll go back to derivatives and go through them in much more detail and more. Another class for pure math students is topology. This is a big field in mathematics. This is essentially the study of shapes, but not like you did in geometry. You look at more abstract shapes, knots, and even higher dimensional objects. In fact, in topology, angles, lengths, and all that don't matter. They care more about holes, number of knots, and so on. The famous saying among topologists is that a coffee mug and a donut are the exact same, because you can morph one into the other, as if they were made out of clay. Again, this has applications in physics, cosmology, quantum field theory, and more, but in undergrad as a physics major, you are not required to take a topology course. And as a math major, you will be doing a lot of proofs again in this class. Hopefully you're seeing that as a pure math student, you really need to enjoy proofs. Pure math students can take complex analysis where you do more proofs but with imaginary numbers, discrete math, number theory, combinatorial math, and more that I won't get into. But as you can see, there are a lot of math intensive courses that physics majors will not encounter. Physics majors are more about learning the higher up calculus and vector math, which directly applies to lots of physical phenomena. But these higher up math classes are at a whole new level of difficulty compared to calculus and vector math. So before I get to careers, let's just break this down. Physics majors and applied math majors both share a bunch of math courses which have direct real-world applications, like the differential equations that represent a traveling wave. Physics majors then go on to take their physics classes, which use a lot of the math from above. While applied math majors will take a proofs class, abstract algebra, and real analysis, which don't directly apply to them as much, but are important foundations to understanding mathematical theory, then they take elective classes that have more direct applications to physics, computer science, and so on. Some of these can be proof-based classes, but you won't see as much of it as a pure math student. Then for pure math students, they don't take vector analysis and partial differential equations, and many won't take these applied math courses that I'll delete. They would take topology, complex analysis, more abstract algebra or maybe more real analysis, discrete math, number theory, and they could also take more linear algebra. Students will differ, but hopefully you get the idea. And note, this is not a guarantee. Pure math students could take some of the other classes listed in applied math, and applied math students could take other classes like complex analysis or more abstract algebra. But this is just to give you an idea of the differences. Now I'm going to talk about careers for physics majors versus applied math students. A lot of pure math students go into mathematical research and work in academia, like at a university, which is what a lot of professors would be doing besides teaching. It's not the only option, but it's a very common one for pure math students. And if you do pure math, really consider getting a master's and even a PhD. If you want to do mathematical research, then you will need further education beyond just a bachelor's. Now when it comes to careers, both of these majors have a wide range of options. You will hear of students in both majors going into computer science jobs, engineering jobs, research jobs, investment analysis, finance, accounting, teaching, and so on. Advanced problem solving skills these majors learn is desirable in itself. It is true that engineers typically have more job opportunities, especially with just a bachelor's, and are favored for those engineering jobs. But as you can see, there are still plenty of options here, and you shouldn't shy away from these majors. But just have a plan for what you are going to do after you get a bachelor's and know your options. But I do want to give examples of jobs and research that lean more towards physics or math so you can distinguish the two in a real world setting. 
Physics majors would be more prepared to do research on elementary particles that make up our universe, like working with particle accelerators. They could study dark matter that surrounds our galaxies, ways to generate electricity from Earth's magnetic field, or study what happens to particles or other matter at extremely high and extremely low temperatures. While a math major may come up with encryption algorithms that secure credit cards, passwords, and government information, a project math students did was to rank baseball players using an advanced mathematical theorem. This is a theorem in linear algebra in which you learn lots of matrix math. So why would this be necessary? Well, that same theorem can help Google rank which pages come first based on what you search. You may not realize just how much goes into making sure your Google searches come up with the best results first, and mathematicians could be in charge of making sure this stays up to date. It won't just be mathematicians working on this, but is something that definitely applies. Maybe mathematicians help with the algorithm that finds the shortest route from one point to another. A lot of work goes into this for companies like Uber, Lyft, or Google when it comes to Google Maps. Or math majors could analyze ways to predict stock market fluctuations. See how these really don't need a physics background? They are real world problems that just require math to solve. Now something I need to emphasize, especially for these two majors, is that so many jobs can be done by people of either discipline. You so often don't have to have one specific degree for various jobs. For example, the CEO of Uber has brought up multiple times that in his quote math department that works on demand prediction of riders, shortest route algorithms, and so on, one of the key people working there is a nuclear physicist. I just said that a math major would be perfect for that kind of job, but instead they have someone who specializes in the study of protons and neutrons and their interactions. That's not related at all really. So why is this? Because these jobs often don't require just one degree. You need the skills to do the job, and various disciplines can give you those skills. And there have also been projects where mathematicians worked on the mathematical physics of quantum mechanics, or where they analyzed complicated fluid mechanics like turbulence in various systems. Those seem like physics positions, but again, your major doesn't dictate exactly what you are able to do. There are plenty of exceptions, but it's just not always the case. Now, everything I said was very specific examples of jobs or research these majors could go into. But don't expect to just get a bachelor's degree in physics or math, then go search for jobs creating encryption algorithms for the government or improving Google search algorithm and just land yourself a job right out of school. These aren't entry level positions and aren't even abundant in opportunity. They are out there though. But you will need to work yourself up or maybe get further education to get jobs like these. I just wanted to show you the differences between what math majors and physics majors could go into to help you pick between the two. So with these two majors, try to have a plan on what you want to do after school. It can be very hard to know this early on, but at least have something. Don't expect the awesome research jobs you see on the internet immediately out of school, but it's good to set your goals high while still being realistic and having an understanding on what jobs are actually out there. Hopefully this cleared things up for you. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and best of luck on your search.